so what should we be cooking with and dressing our salads with and like what what oils yes, okay. and fats should so, we be using um, so butter is your fat for putting in your oatmeal and your bread and your vegetables and mm-hmm. I've been putting oh, I've been putting butter in my oatmeal recently, by the way, yes. and it's a game changer. I'm just yeah, loving it's so it. Delicious, <laughs> yes. Um, we cook in lard. We cook in pig fat. It's a very stable fat. It's a great source of vitamin D. Also, of something called arachidonic acid, which I have a happy making fat. So, uh, and then I buy the very best olive oil. Mm-hmm. So much of olive oil is adulterated for making my our salad dressings. So would that be cold pressed ex- extra virgin? Do you have me buy virgin, some olive? Even so, you put a little bowl of it in the fridge and see right. if it like, kind of gets semi solid. Yes. You know it's real olive oil. Well, welcome, Sally Fallon Morell. This is such a pleasure. Um, I'm so happy to have you on my podcast. This has been a long time coming. I know that we've been um, trying to arrange um, appointments before, but um, now we've <laughs> <few> finally... mishaps, yeah. <laughs> a few mishaps, but um, we're finally here and I couldn't be happier. So um, how is everything over there? It looks really lovely and bright where you are. Oh, thank you. Yes. Well, I'm in Southern Maryland Mm -hmm. and our news is we got an inch of rain the other day because we were in a drought here. Um, Things are very dry. Yeah. Wow. So you got some rain recently. Yes. yes. Oh, fabulous. That's really, really good. And I know that's really important because obviously, um, you know, you run a farm, a really beautiful farm. Um, I had the pleasure of um, browsing through some of the photos before coming onto this call and oh my gosh, it's so charming. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Yeah, yeah, it's really lovely. Um, but the reason why this conversation is so important and the reason why my listeners, if they don't already know who you are, they need to know who you are because <laughs> <laughs> what you do is so, so important. And it's really remarkable um, how what you do came about. So um, what I wanted to kind of ask, first of all, is um, just for you to kind of give a bit of background as to who you are and then I want to ask about the Western A Price Foundation which is a remarkable story so um whenever you're ready let's let's hear it well um you know I was um a young woman I was a teacher and I loved to cook and I came from a family of foodies everybody liked to cook in my family and uh, we were eating um paella and um you know prosciutto and all these things long before anyone had ever heard of them so uh, and I cooked with lots of butter and cream my mother and I were really enthralled with Julia Childs and and this was uh, so this is the mid 70s um, I had one child at this point and that's when this low-fat message was really starting to come out and especially that you were supposed to put children on a low-fat diet and I just knew this wasn't right um, First of all, I was healthy. My daughter was healthy. And it just, it just didn't seem right. So in 1974, I stumbled upon Dr. Price's book, Nutrition and Physical Degeneration, which has these wonderful photographs of healthy traditional people with broad faces and naturally straight teeth. They all had, not, none of them needed braces. So, um, and the diets that they ate had fats in them, organ meats, liver, meat, you know, seafood. They were varied diets. They had plant foods, carbs, they had everything, but particularly fats. And this validated what I was already doing. And I just continued. I ended up with four children. None of them needed braces. And I just fed them this way. So then uh, when my youngest went to school full time, I got the idea to write a cookbook that put Dr. Price's findings in a practical form for a little bit more accessible to people, uh, which I did. The book is called Nourishing Traditions, and it took me nine years to write it. And I worked with Dr. Mary Ennig, who is a PhD in lipid science. She really, I couldn't have done it without her. Anyway, um, once the book came out, we decided to set up a foundation that just kept up with the science, kept up with the issues, and uh, published a journal. So uh, in 1999, we founded the Weston A. Price Foundation. And the rest is history. (laughs) (laughs) 
Um, and and to say uh, that you released the book Nourishing Traditions, I mean, it was more than just a book. It's it's been uh, it's an absolute classic now um, in many kitchens across the world. You know, it's so funny because um, I'd never written a book before. Um, That's my incredible. Kids, uh, my my kids were of course um, teased me and were skeptical. Uh, and when it came out, I, I really had no idea what I was doing. And it no sold. wonder it took nine years to write. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and it sold a few copies. And then someone, a little distributor picked it up. And, and so I had all these boxes in my garage and I was sending them off to Amazon. Well, suddenly, and without any marketing on my behalf, the book just kind of took off because I think it was word of mouth. It was so different from any other book out there. And suddenly I was selling 6,000 copies a month and I, a distributor found me and I didn't go looking. And, you know, um, then my dad helped me um, found the, the company, New Trends Publishing, Bank of Dad. And um, you know, this one thing led to another. It, it really, sh to me, it was the universe at work that this book needed to come out and it just shows that that's what people were looking for and it's what people are still looking for because i have to say i've 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 pulled out the nourishing traditions again recently like um because of all the recent conversations i've been having and knowing i was going to speak to you as well i've i've, I've pulled it out again and i i can understand why you wanted to write it because when you learn what weston a. price found and you yeah. learn about his research the passion if you're a home cook especially and if you care about your health and your family's health the the passion that comes with oh my gosh I need to cook this way I need to spread yeah. the word like I, I me myself I started to feel it again when I was going through your book I was like oh. I've been making the sourdough bread with the starter yeah. and like I've been going through the book again and so I can understand your passion for wanting to write a book and be like I want to put this out there because it's so important that everybody knows that this is how you know we should be eating one of the things about the book that's really different is the uh, way the grains are prepared. That's right. And uh, so you have to understand this is um, right at the height of diet for a small planet and all of these so-called health food books that put the emphasis on whole grains. And it all just makes sense. After all, there's, there's more nutrition in whole grains than refined grains. But we were also seeing people having, getting into real trouble on grains and we're seeing gluten intolerance and people who just can't do grains yeah and i was sort of floating one of those things. yeah if i ate oatmeal i would collapse two hours later like with toxic shock so um i got to looking into this and 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 price didn't talk about how to prepare grains he didn't look that far but I thought if we're going to do this book that's really based on traditional people we we have to look at everything and I found some books, uh, they were, some were recommended to me, and um, a couple of them were in French, fortunately I, I speak French, and uh, so that kind of set me on this um, path to, yeah. to, like, to soak the oatmeal, the pancakes in the book, everyone just loves the sourdough pancakes. Yes, yes, I, I think I'm gonna have to make them next, because they, yeah, they, they really are delicious, yeah. and um, <laughs> and the sourdough bread and just uh, the soaking of the grains. And yeah. um, I think that resonated with a lot of people because a lot of people were struggling with this grain thing. Yeah. You know, yes, we should be eating whole grains, but how come they make me feel so bad? See? Yeah. And whole grains are extremely hard to digest. They have a lot of toxins in them. Mm -hmm. And by soaking and fermenting, you um, neutralize all of this. And then the grains really are a nutritious food. And then do you find that people's gluten intolerances, do you find that they get less um, when they prepare the grains properly? Yes. Or... And in fact, there was a study in Italy where they took people who were diagnosed as gluten intolerant, gave them genuine sourdough bread, and they had no problem. Wow. Well, that's so uh, there's a lot of science supporting this. And I love that when you get the scientific validation of traditional food ways. Yeah. Um, I want to dig into um, Dr. Weston Price's work a little bit more because it really is a remarkable story. And anybody who doesn't know what it's about, um, that it's it's so, so important because this kind of is the, the foundation of what you do and will kind yes. of, you know, carry the rest of this conversation. So 
he as far as I know a long time ago this then he's a dentist he was dentist, he was a dentist. yes his practice and... was in Cleveland right. Ohio in the 20s and 30s and he he was very interested in nutrition and this is a time when uh, people like McCullum were starting to publish all these papers mm. about nutrition. And he was also very concerned about the health of his patients because all he could see in people's mouths were infection and decay. And then like we have the, today still. Yes, yeah. yes. And dental deformities, um, people who had crowded crooked teeth. And the world was opening up at this time. We had airplanes and cameras. And the number one impression that anthropologists and explorers had when they stumbled upon a new isolated population was what beautiful teeth they had. You know, imagine coming from America and walking into a village and everybody's smiling and they all have naturally straight teeth. It, oh, it's striking, oh, it would strike yeah. anybody. Yes. Um, yeah. So the, the other um, number one impression was how easy childbirth was for these people. That's unbelievable when I hear yeah. that part of the story. And, and, that, like, and they oh. go together. When, when the face is broad and teeth are straight, the pelvic opening is round, not oval. And that's the ideal shape for the baby to come out. So it, it goes along with the teeth. <laughs> okay. Anyway, Dr. Price visited 14 healthy populations with perfect teeth and seemed to be very resistant to disease of all sorts. And the di diets were all different. You had dairy foods and grains in Switzerland, and you had seafood and oats in the Outer Hebrides, and then you had fish and pig and um, yams in mm. the South Seas. You know, so he found they were all different, but there were some commonalities. And the main thing was that these diets were very high in vitamins and minerals, much higher than the American diet, and especially what he called the fat-soluble activators. These are vitamins A, D, and K. And we get them from organ meats, animal fats, eggs, um, you know, butter, certain types of seafoods like fish eggs, shellfish, pretty much all the foods they're telling us not to eat today mm -hmm. are, were the foods that provided these crucial nutrients and which were valued for having healthy babies. Mm -hmm. So, you know, what he's saying just flies in the face of the dietary guidelines. Yeah. Um, when I, I read his book um, a while ago, it's a very heavy read. Yes, um, yes. So I, I don't actually think I finished it because it was so heavy. And I think I, no, I and, and know, of course, the last chapter, chapter 22 is the most important chapter. Oh my gosh. The, okay. I need to get well, to chapter just 22. Don't get there. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, but, but what, what I did see and what was really interesting is because I come from, you know, the fitness industry, and then obviously I'm a nutritionist now, there's so much debate about um, you know Mediterranean diet keto diet carnivore like there's so many different diets but then when you read no and when you read his book um it it was so surprising to see that everybody ate differently so yes. you know everyone was eating grains you know all yeah. the things that we were told not to eat and everybody was eating you know animal fats and dairy and you know everyone's yeah. told to avoid dairy these days and but they were eating it and in perfect health um and like you said you know perfect teeth um, broad faces, no yeah. need for braces, yeah. um, and in and really strong, good personalities. Yes, and good posture. Yes, straight backs. See yeah. the teeth and the, the. We have thirty-two teeth, and we have thirty-two bones in the spinal cord, and they're formed at the same time in the body, and then they separate and half go to the teeth, and half go to the spinal cord. So, mm -hmm. the spinal cord has a real relationship with the teeth. Yeah, and these people had very good posture, very straight. Uh, backs good musculature uh, I mean you know he called them splendid specimens splendid there's specimens. this funny video of him <laughs> kind of hitting this guy on the chest and saying oh look at this splendid specimen <laughs> uh, I think I saw that video recently yeah, yeah, yeah. you can't forget that video right um, but they were they were just uh, gorgeous people and that's what we need to get back to now today in this country one child and two has some kind of serious health problem yeah and, and we're not feeding our kids right and then we're injecting them with poisons and um, um, there's poisons in the food supply poisons in the water yeah um and it's it's up to us you know um nature's not going to do this for us nature supplied us with the perfect genetic code in every yeah. person 
but whether that genetic code is manifest is uh, that's up to us, the parents, and how we raise our kids. It's so, our responsibility. Uh, hmm. So the the issue really, um, from your perspective, is that um, basically the you know the, the heavy processing of foods, um, the way the foods are grown. Um, the way the foods are um, basically put together and sold to us in the, the everyday supermarket is is these foods that are the problem. I I saw a, quite a, a crazy statistic the other day um, that about seventy percent of all of our supermarkets um, are um, ultra processed foods. Oh, yeah, seventy percent. Yeah, um, and that that's that's alarming because even someone who's health conscious when you're exposed to 70% ultra processed yeah. foods, you can't help, but, you know, put some into your trolley, you know, and God forbid, if you go shopping with your child and yeah, they just oh, no, you don't never take them with you. <laughs> <laughs> exactly, never. Um, yeah. So, so from your perspective, it's really this, this, that's the problem. And this is why, you know, when, you know, so you live, do you live on the, on the farm? Yes. You know? We, yeah, we, so we live like on a farm. Do, yeah. We produce uh, raw milk and raw cheese, raw cream. Right. Yeah. Uh, uh pastured pork um pastured beef yeah and we also sell in our store f ferments and sourdough bread and we try to unrefined salt but you know we're in southern maryland it's mm -hmm. not a very sophisticated part of the world it's very rural yep. and at the local supermarket um they just replaced all their shopping carts with carts that are about 50 percent bigger they're very wide yeah and I, I am just so shocked and saddened when I see what goes into those carts, including that we have Amish people who shop there. Wow. And first of all, it's the sodas and then the potato chips and the breakfast cereals. And mm -hmm. maybe on top of that, there'll be a package of ground beef and a package of carrots. Yeah. And, and this is the, the beef is basically the only real nutrient dense thing that they're eating. I was and, um... and it just it's just um, the the one saving grace where we are here is we have wonderful seafood and hmm. you know it's kind of a big thing to go out and have crabs and oysters and things so oh, that fabulous. does say but people are buying these tubs of spreads you know they're this big hmm. and I don't I rarely see butter in the carts. Right. And I I do want to dive into butter and animal meat at some point. Um, but what I do want to mention is um I was reading a book the other day, um, God Robert Lustig. Um oh, yes. the, the um, book is metabolical. Sugar. Yeah. Yes. Um it's, it's, yeah, it's, yeah. It's, it's, it's I think it's his latest one, metabolical. And he said he gave some advice about how to go shopping in the supermarket. Yeah. And um one of the points is really interesting. He said, um, he said, stick to the, to the outside rim yes. of the supermarket. Yes. And he yes. said, if you go, if you go off track, then you're off track. Like if you yeah. go into the middle, right. then if yeah. you go down the aisle, then you're off track. Yeah. And I was like, God, that's so interesting because you do, you, you know, you walk in to the supermarket, they have all the colors yeah. there in front of you to say, yeah, we're healthy, come in. And yeah. then, um, and then obviously they've got the meat and the dairy around the edges. Yes. Um, yeah. And, and then maybe the bread aisle at the end. I, yeah. I, so yeah, we we you know we like to get people away from the supermarket habit yeah, and that's one right. of the really positive things that's happened over the 20 last 20 years first of all we've got the internet now mm. and we have lots and lots of small farms uh just in the state of maryland for example uh, we got the first raw milk permit it has to stay for pets for dogs mm. and cats <clears throat> anyway uh there are now four farms like ours doing exactly what we're doing so anyone in maryland who wants raw milk can get it and that was not true 20 years ago yeah so we say spend 50 percent of your food dollars in direct purchase from farmers and artisans mm -hmm. and then the other 50 percent you can celebrate how small the world has become because after all when you go into that fruit and vegetable section and you can buy pineapples and papayas and things that's a miracle that's yeah. a miracle and shows how you know, we're just connected to the whole world today. Yeah. And if you want to eat rice, for example, um, that's kind of a miracle to have rice in Southern Maryland. <laughs> so yeah. so uh, we're not turning our back on modernity. We're just saying, you know, don't make all of your things you eat from the supermarket. 
Right, right. You make um, two stops, one at your farm and then one to the market to get the other peach you make. Yeah, that's that's good advice. Um, it's practical as well um, for people who have access to smaller kind of farm stores. But um, what, what I really, really wanted to dig into with you um, mm -hmm. is obviously two topics that I know you're very passionate about and you've spoken about many times. Um, the first topic is dairy. Um, yes. You are the butter queen. And the uh, brown milk queen. <laughs> yeah. Um, I, was that given to you? Was that title given to you, or would you have you given it to yourself? You're just like I'm uh, well, the butter queen. I, I don't know. <laughs> Tell me that. Yeah. Yeah. So um, I. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, basically, um, what I wanted to ask is, you know, so ed everybody listening, and many of my clients, and um, you know, so many people around the world. I just like do we need to be eating dairy or do we not need to be eating dairy can I have my cheese please or do I need to yes. get rid of it so what do you have to no. say about dairy no. so dairy is very important in the western diet the source of calcium mm -hmm. and traditional cultures that didn't have dairy products first of all they were shorter they didn't grow as tall and they also had to take steps to get calcium usually by crushing up the bones of birds and small animals and putting it in their food. So if you're not eating dairy, um, you, you need to do something else, especially if you want to give your child the gift of being tall. Mm. It is a gift and tall people are more successful in, in every way. Um, I remember, I, I still have it in my cupboard. It's a, a, a can of powdered bones that I bought in the Korean market. So they were using these bones and adding it to their soups and, and oh, things like that. That is just pure calcium right there. Yeah, it's yeah, just I would, the best I would you much can get. rather get my <laughs> calcium from delicious dairy foods. But at the same time, the dairy foods in this country have been completely ruined by modern processing. They're not only pasteurized, they're ultra pasteurized, which takes them to 230 degrees in just a few seconds. This is a very violent, harsh, type of processing and a recent study showed that any type of processing even freeze drying warps and distorts the proteins in the milk and makes them very toxic to us and this is why dairy you know milk consumption is you know rapidly declining mm -hmm. uh, but the good news is that raw milk consumption is rapidly increasing all the raw milk farmers are selling out so and raw milk a, basically means that it hasn't been pasteurized. So, so how ha, has has raw milk had any uh, treatment, or has it literally just gone from the cow to or the, 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 the goat main or the sheep? thing is or... you want to chill it down quickly. Yeah. Uh, not that it's bad to keep it at room temperature. Actually, raw milk gets uh, safer as as because it, it just naturally ferments. It actually gets safer. But people like the taste of milk that's you know fresh. Mm. So you, you chill it down quickly. Uh, on our farm, we test every batch of milk for coliform and typically zero. Um, so there's a lot of things you can do to ensure that it's a really clean, safe milk. Um, so we have the technology, the point is we have the technology today to get clean raw milk to every, every growing child in this country, everybody who wants it. And instead we use our technology to destroy nature's perfect food. Uh, then we have cheese, and cheese, of course, is a storage food. Um, now, even in the supermarket, the cheese, I think, is still a good food because they cannot use ultra-pasteurized milk to make cheese. This okay. shows you it's indigestible. So they have to use just pasteurized milk. And that, that calcium is, is quite available and absorbed in cheese. Mm. Okay. Um, so when someone goes to the supermarket and they you know, want to get skimmed milk, semi-skimmed milk. Oh, no, 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 <laughs> Yeah, That's I mean, no um, um, milk comes with fat for a reason. Mm. You need the vitamins and the fat to absorb the calcium in the milk and absorb the protein in the milk. Otherwise, the milk is going to be toxic. Mm. So this is one of the worst things we do is promote skim milk, and we're giving skim milk to school children, uh, which is a kind of genocide. Um, you cannot have fertility on skim milk. What really needs to be done with, I mean, of course, when we milk cows, we also like to get the cream and to make the butter. So you have a lot of skim milk left over. Mm -hmm. And this is what the dairy industry is doing. It's foisting it on the public and saying it's good for you. But when you live on a farm where you have pigs and chickens, it's 
skim milk is a wonderful food for them. And in fact, years ago, the Department of Agriculture did a study on the best way to fatten pigs, and they found that the best way was to feed them skim milk. So nothing's wasted when you have a mixed farm. Mm -hmm. But of course, what the um, Department of Agriculture promotes is single species farm. So you have all your pigs in South Carolina and your dairy cows in Wisconsin. Uh, you can't get that skim milk to the pigs. So. And the way from making cheese. So when we make cheese, our our um, way goes to the pigs. Do you think um, that, you know, there's many people struggle with dairy intolerance and, yeah. you know, I've had um, a couple of autoimmune specialists on the podcast and, you know, they often say dairy, you know, take it out. That's usually the thing that is, you know, part of the problem. And, often it, and often it is because of because, the way it's processed. Right. That's right. But we if did it was a, raw, it'd be a different story. Yes, we mm -hmm. did a survey. We found that 82% die of people diagnosed with um, uh, lactose intolerance mm -hmm. could drink raw milk without any problem. 82%. Now, there's still a small percentage that really can't do any kind of dairy, and I understand yeah. that, but <clears throat> most people can do raw dairy. As, and raw that. whole dairy, you know. Right. Not just that it's processed, but the fat's taken out. Hmm. And you know what's incredible? Um, I think it was even 10 years ago. So I, I come from London. So I used mm -hmm. to um, obviously live there. And uh -huh. um, <laughs> um, when, when I was trying to access raw milk from London, it was yeah. very difficult. And um, it was almost today. illegal. Um, it's much easier today. There's a lot of raw milk farmers in, in England. And I, I find that really lovely because back then I remember there was one health food store in central mm -hmm. london like a really fancy one i think it was like a like a just a really unique store um where they just sold raw milk and it was just one place like one farmer and mm -hmm. um i i don't even know if it lasted in there i don't even know if it you know sold mm -hmm. and it, it stayed there um but i checked recently and now that you know you can just go online and you can just order yeah. um raw milk and raw yeah. dairy which is such a nice change because I mean there was a lot of stigma before about raw dairy mm -hmm. um people were saying oh you know you'll get sick if you have raw yeah. dairy yeah 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 so no, how did you overcome that the well you know, the we showed that it's safe mm -hmm. um I have a presentation I give where I show all the components in raw milk that kill pathogens and we've mm -hmm. also just followed the statistics uh, up until we got started, they anybody who got sick and had drunk raw milk, of course, it blamed it on the milk. And they were, uh, we did an analysis of all these studies where they said raw milk had made people sick, and we showed that they had absolutely no proof it was the milk. Mm. Um, so they're much they, <laughs> the industry and the uh, regulators, are much more cautious today when they blame something on raw milk because they know we'll be right after them if. They don't have absolute proof and, and they never have proof. Meanwhile, the last two or three deaths from milk in this country were from pasteurized milk. That was in 2007. Right. So right. Um, I, I the, you know, they, the, the uh, FDA says there's been a couple of deaths from raw milk, but they, they're very cagey. They won't tell us where they happened or who it was it, or there's no report. So yeah. um, it, it's really a very, uh, look, eggs cost, cause 30 deaths a year in this country. Oysters cause 15 deaths a year in this country. But are they taking those off the market? Are they having a big campaign telling people not to eat oysters or eggs because mm. they're unsafe? No, they, they wouldn't dare. And they, they've got to stop singling out with their double standard, singling out raw milk. So what is the problem then? Why, why are people still pasteurizing milk? Is it because it's just easier to sell oh, and yeah, to it, preserve? It, it, and... So when the farmer, when the milk has to be pasteurized by law in the stores or whatever, the farmer has to sell to the dairy company. He cannot sell directly. Mm -hmm. And there's only four dairy companies in this country and they all have their territories. So the farmer has absolutely no choice about the price he gets for his milk. It's a, a Marxist industrial system. Mm -hmm. And every year, dairy farms go out of business, never to return. It has absolutely destroyed rural life in this country because there's no more prosperous dairy farms anymore. 
Mm -hmm. uh, I recently read about a farmer who went out of business. He was getting 85 cents per hundred weight for his milk. That's, you know, it's mm -hmm. like eight cents a gallon. I mean, what, how do you expect these farms to survive? Yeah. And they can't, there's nothing they can do about it. Whereas if they switch to raw milk, and many of them have, and they're selling directly to the customer, uh, they get anywhere from five to $25 a gallon. Wow. We get $14 a gallon for our milk. And that's what's scary because I remember growing up, there was a butcher like, but like with fresh meat and mm -hmm. there was probably a butcher in every town, but now um, they're, there's they're gone. barely any, they're, they're yeah. gone. And, and the only butchers um, you have are ones that are really kind of, um, kind of chic and um, expensive yeah, yeah. and because they're just, yeah. yeah. Right. Um, mm -hmm. So it's, so I think by supporting local um, you know, produce local farms. Well, that's the only way we're going to save them because mm. it's not going to come from the top. Um, the Department of Agriculture mm. is basically a communist um, organization that doesn't believe in small independent farmers. They say, we'll starve if we have small independent farmers. And we have to have this huge industrial system where the farmers are just cogs in the wheel. They're peasants mm -hmm. and they can't, they have no control over their lives. Yeah. The chicken farming has gotten like this. Um, the chicken farmers have these horrible contracts with the processors and they can't choose their price. They can't complain. They can't change anything in their um, uh, contract. Um, and it's interesting what the Department of Agriculture does is come after the small chicken raisers and, and say that they've got bird flu or something uh, to put them out of business and to put away the competition. My gosh, that is. It, it's, I think most people have no idea what's really happening yeah. as far as food is concerned and how important it is for all of us to resist this just by the way we spend our food dollars. Right. Um, so if, if somebody wanted to, so basically I live in the Cayman Islands and I believe by checking the Western A price website, mm -hmm. my my local raw milk supplier is in Panama. So that's oh, about yes, that's, yeah, like somebody a, has to... that's a two hour flight, I think. Um, yeah. So for someone like myself or someone who just doesn't have access to raw mm -hmm. dairy, what advice do you have for them? Or for well, me, I would, basically. <laughs> yes, I would. Yes, I would do a good quality cheese. I'm sure you can get good quality cheese. Yes, and yeah. plenty of butter, of course. Yeah. yeah. And would you advise against whole milk, even if it was organic, grass fed? What do you think about that? Uh, I would advise against past. Well, it's going to be ultra pasteurized. Okay. I'm sure. I would advise. Against. Okay. Um, and obviously butter. Now I know that butter is um, some, an ingredient that you're very passionate about. And um, how, how should we use butter in our daily lives? Yes, well, a lot of it. <laughs> <laughs> um, and there are some brands of grass-fed butter. We have two brands of New Zealand butter available to us now. Mm. And we have Irish butter, a couple brands of Irish butter. Okay. They're, it's pasture, basically pasture-fed. Um, I think the minimum of requirement for, for butter is four tablespoons a day. Wow. So yeah, that's a lot of I butter. Mean, but that that's but that's not shocking to me because if you were to talk to someone who, um, you know, I've I've discussed the ketogenic diet with you know a few people in the past, and one one of the um, recommendations is to have four tablespoons of olive oil or four tablespoons oh, yeah. of MCT See, now, olive oil. oil is <laughs> not going to supply all the good fats and fat soluble vitamins and there are so many things in butter mm. butter after all is the fat in nature for the growth and development of all mammals whether it's a whale or a goat or a human mm. and there can't be anything wrong with it i mean there's very specific components that support hormone formation feel good chemicals a gut health uh you know healthy skin it's it's just the perfect fat yeah, yeah. And the idea that we would demonize butter it can only come from people who are going to make money on the competition. What's the competition is vegetable oil, mm. um, margarines and spreads. Right. And right. this is what's killing us. We yes. call this the yes. omega-6 apocalypse. It's the, you know, sh sugar is bad. Additives are bad. Processing is bad. But the number one 
component of the diet that's killing us is the seed oils, industrial seed oils. Right. And butter and lard are their competition. And they've spent the past hundred years demonizing their competition. So the, the next natural question then would be, um, so what should we be cooking with and dressing our salads with? And like what, what oils yes. okay. and fats should so, we be using? Um, so butter is your fat for putting on your oatmeal and your bread and your vegetables and mm -hmm. I've been putting oh, I've been putting butter in my oatmeal recently, by the way, yes. and it's a game changer. I'm just yeah, loving it's so it. Delicious, <laughs> yes. Um, we cook in lard. We cook mm -hmm. in pig fat. It's a very stable fat. It's a great source of vitamin D. Also, of something called arachidonic acid, which is kind of a happy making fat. So, uh, and then I buy the very best olive oil. Mm -hmm. So much of olive oil is adulterated for making my our salad dressings. So would that be cold pressed, extra, extra virgin? Do you extra have any advice on it? Even so, mm -hmm. you put a little bowl of it in the fridge and see right. if it uh, kind of gets semi-solid. Yes. You know it's real olive oil. Sure, that's uh, just just one point on that. Sorry, mm -hmm. um, I was um, getting some olive oil from one of the best suppliers in yeah. California, and yeah. it was supposed to be like it's very expensive. And um, I tried that test. I put it in the fridge. Yeah. And it didn't, it didn't get, yeah. it didn't turn into a gel at all. And I was like, oh my God, I don't know if I believe this then. And I was like, because this is the best olive oil, surely um, it, this is the real deal. But then it didn't turn into a gel. So I was really confused. I, I did, I was like, oh my God, is, is the, is, is it wrong when people say it should turn into a gel or is the brand itself just not, you know, producing the there, best olive oil? I mean, there's so much adulteration. Um, mm. I get, I have to say, I get my olive oil from my brother who has some olive trees. Oh, perfect. And so I know that it's not adulterated and yeah. it gets sort of like, gel, you know, thick when you okay. put it in the fridge. So that's yeah, a test. Absolutely. That's a yeah. test for everyone to do at that's home. That's the test. And not many brands are, are going to pass the test. So I also use duck fat, which is a great fat. Um, I, I use it for cooking and making um, oven fries and things like that. I do use a little coconut oil and it has its uses, but it's not an animal fat. It's not going to give you the fat soluble vitamins. Mm -hmm. uh, cod liver oil, of course, you don't cook with, but we, mm. that is a fat that we take as a supplement. Yeah. And then um, I also use beef, beef drippings, beef tallow. Um, one of the things my husband likes is oyster fritters and they need to be really crisp. Oh, and so with something like that, yeah. you, you want to use tallow. Okay. And then obviously good quality olive oil, um maybe avocado oil I don't use avocado okay. oil. all right all right dishes of it. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay okay um so basically just to wrap up on dairy um so if somebody was to say oh please don't take away my cheese you would say you don't have to take away your no, cheese no, just I wouldn't take choose away the cheese. best yeah. quality cheese that you can find yes. and um how would you know? So, so one the of the problems strategy? with modern cheese, I hate yeah. to throw a monkey wrench in here, but yeah. um, old fashioned cheese is made with animal rennet, which comes from the stomach of the calf. Mm -hmm. And most modern cheeses are made with vegetable rennet, which is made with genetically modified bacteria. Right. And people who are very sensitive to chemicals cannot eat cheese made with um, vegetarian rennet. So look for animal rennet in the cheese. Okay, that okay. helps too. Um, so so that's that's great news, and obviously to to get raw milk as you know, much we, as we, we can. We like to show how inclusive a diet can be, and not exclusive. In other words, mm -hmm. we're not saying you can't have potatoes or sweet potatoes or uh, rice or any things. We just show you how to do it with plenty of fats. In our diet, we, we like to say you can have it all on our mm. diet. You just have to be careful about the food quality. A uh, perfect example is soft drinks. Of course, we all know that they're just poisons. But now, um, I don't know when, about the Cayman Islands, but here you can buy kombucha in almost any supermarket. Yeah. And it's easy to make kombucha. Mm -hmm. So we have an alternative uh, uh, for soft drinks. Uh, we don't say you can't have sweet things. We just say be careful and make your own with real foods, real fats, and with um, natural sweeteners. So it's um, it's not you know if you propose a diet that 
people have to use a lot of willpower to follow, it's not going to work. I tell you, yeah. it's not going to work. Motivation doesn't last. Yeah. Uh, we also, of course, include salt in the diet. You can have as much salt as you want yeah. until the food tastes good to you. And we, but we recommend unrefined salt. I saw a fabulous salt on sale um, yesterday in a, in a health food store, um, Celtic sea salt, but it mm -hmm. wasn't, but it was, but it was, it was, um, it looked like a very special, um, special way because it's gray and it was kind of wet yes. in the packet. And I was like, yeah, that's, that's real salt. That's what we use in our cheese. Yeah. Great. All right. Perfect. Yeah. Um, and that's the sign of really good salt, right? When yeah, it's not pure yeah. white, you yeah, know, exactly. it's probably looking a bit, it doesn't look yeah. very appetizing. Beige, but, pink or yeah. gray, I mean, that's a good salt. <laughs> Um, there was a really interesting um, take when you were talking about how food is prepared and you don't want to take food away. You just want to show people how to eat their food. Yeah. There's a really interesting perspective that I heard recently. Um, and they said basically that the human digestive system is very um, is very simple and you need to help it. You need to give it all the help you can exactly. outside before you eat it. So exactly. that's why fermentation, um, leaving things to rest, soaking, um, all soaking. of those things is so Marinating, important. Right. Yeah. But we are a, we do have a stomach that produces hydrochloric acid. Mm. So it's a, an organ uniquely dedicated to digesting meat mm. and not all you know, the herbivores don't have hydrochloric acid in their stomach. So we are designed to eat meat. And then our intestinal, our intestine is much shorter than that of an herbivore. So we That's, definitely need to pre-digest our foods. Because really, when you look at fermentation and you look at, you know, um, the preparation of foods, it's, it's usually aimed at plant foods, like yes, kind of yes. like, because it's the plant foods that have the defenses up, you know, they're kind right. of like, don't and eat me. You're right. And but there are ways of eating meat too. I mean, right. a lot of people have trouble with meat and one is to make sure you're eating plenty of salt mm -hmm. so you can make hydrochloric acid. We need salt for the chlorine to make hydrochloric chloride, to make hydrochloric acid. You need to eat meat with the fat. No traditional culture ate lean meat. And it's also very helpful to eat meat with broth. Mm. So you, with the bone broth, which has a lot of collagen and gelatin in it. So you make a gravy or a sauce, or you use it for soups or whatever. Mm. And I've had people write to me and say, I couldn't eat meat. It just made me sick until I learned to eat it with broth. Mm. Okay, okay. So why, why should we be um, eating meat? And I know on your um, on your with your farm, you you sell nose to tail. Yes. Just, you know all, all of the you know liver, the organ meats, and the everything. So why why should we be eating nose to tail? Um, what is it about animal meat that is so necessary for us? Well, it's complete protein, which mm -hmm. you don't get from the plant, especially lysine. And you want a diet that has more lysine in it than arginine, which is the kind of plant protein, mm -hmm. amino acid. Uh, you, you, the minerals are much more available than they are in plants. Uh, you get your fat soluble vitamins. It's just a much more nutrient dense food. I have a chart that I show and, you know, apples and carrots are hardly have anything in them compared to meat. And then liver, of course, is the ideal food. And we should be eating liver one way or another once a week, um, the way our ancestors did. So because liver is a hundred times more nutrient dense than plant foods. And, I and believe... it's the whole point is to get, get as much nut nutrition in your body as you can. Yeah. And if you try to do this with plant foods, you just have to eat all day long. Like a cow, a cow eats all day long. Interesting point. Yeah. Um, I believe it was, I had a conversation with Natasha Camel McBride, which I know is a board member of the Western A Price Foundation. And, um, she basically she she said something really catchy um you know that liver is like a resuscitation for someone yes. who struggles with anemia yes and absolutely. i was just like wow like that's if there's no other reason to eat liver then just yeah. listen to that and and it's so many people are anemic today mm. and then they don't have any energy and they can't do the things they want to do mm. you we're talking about um, somewhere, uh, I can't remember where I saw it, but um, the fat soluble vitamins, A, D, E, and, and K. K. And I, I, I think you focused on A and K a bit more and D. 
Mm -hmm. uh, anyway. Well, ED you <laughs> yes. can get from plant foods. Right, okay. But uh, AD and K you can only get from animal foods. Right, and you were saying how you need those to even absorb any minerals. of the other minerals in your diet. Or the other vitamins. Or the other right. Vitamins. You need them to make hormones. Uh, you need them for feel-good chemicals. You need them to put that calcium in the bones where it belongs mm -hmm. instead of leaving it in the soft tissues where it doesn't belong. That's what vitamin K does. So these are just the fundamental vitamins that we need. And we only get them from animal foods. And if you're not eating animal foods, you're going to get in trouble eventually. And please don't try to have children if you're only eating animal food. It's not fair. It's not fair to them. Um, I can imagine if someone's listening and they're a vegetarian, um, they might be thinking, okay, so, you know, either not buying into it or, um, or maybe wondering how to you know make the switch like okay so what shall i do first yeah. um do you have any advice for someone who doesn't eat meat or you know tends to avoid well meat? do it our way um uh, first animal food i put in your diet is butter and mm -hmm. i would start with raw milk i think that's a great uh, beginning animal food uh, for vegetarians um you know so many promises are made to vegetarians that they're mm -hmm. going to be healthier which is not true uh, that they're going to be more spiritual. But the, the spiritual diet is the diet that makes you healthy and gives you lots of energy because we are here to, you know, people think the goal is to go to heaven. No, the goal is to bring heaven to earth. Mm -hmm. And we are here as God's representatives to make earth a heavenly place to live for all human beings. And that requires energy. It requires thinking. It requires effort. Each one has a little part to play and a small but important part to play. And the number one responsibility of all of us is to eat a diet that keeps us healthy. And, and also just so we're not a burden on people. You know, we don't want to have to, people to have to take care of us. Yeah, absolutely. So when buying meat, um, obviously, so the first thing would be to try and source it from um, yeah. maybe a local farmer or yeah. um, a local yeah. butcher or store. Um, but again, if someone, you know, only has access to a supermarket, um, would you recommend organic through and through? Yeah, I would see if you can get pasture fed meats mm -hmm. today. Um, I mean, just do the best you can, even if you can't get you know, what we would consider ideal meat, you still need meat, you still mm. need the fats, so just bless it. Yeah, okay. Um. So what I wanted to just ask is, I mean, when I was kind of diving into nourishing traditions and um, diving into your work and, and having, having a fresh kind of perspective of it again, um, I started to feel a bit of overwhelm because I thought, gosh, I don't have access to, you know, good raw dairy i don't have access yeah. to a farm here because we we only have um organic farms um with with fruits and vegetables here yeah. we don't have well, any animal that's farms something and... that's a start <laughs> that's a start right um but if but how how um so if if someone feels a bit overwhelmed um would you say that the first thing to do is to okay um just start with you know maybe adding good quality butter to your diet like yes Get are there any steps that's right you um, yes uh, get this, you know, don't eat the breakfast cereals. They're, mm. they're quite toxic. Learn to soak your oats and make oatmeal. I mean, anybody can do that. Yeah. Put butter on them and honey or whatever. Mm. Uh, start with the simple things. Uh, so, learn to get a slow cooker and save your chicken bones and make mm. chicken broth. Um, so just the simple things. So take out ultra processed foods. Yes. And, um, and um, I, I, I never say the most important yeah. thing is to go organic. Mm. I mean, it's great if you can. The most important thing is <clears throat> these key fundamental concepts, mm. the right fats, soaking your grains, some fermented foods, it's mm. really good to include. Yeah. <clears throat> I don't know if you can get sauerkraut or whatever, but. We can. I mean, we have access to the uh, the U.S. food supply. <laughs> 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 So we have all the stuff that you guys have in the supermarkets. Um, but as you know, it's it's not the best quality, mostly. Yeah. Um, but it's a start, yeah. Yeah. And um, what I usually like to recommend, and I wonder if you agree, um, just 
trying to cook from home more. Oh, like, yes. Absolutely. That's the first and, thing. And, you know, another thing is cook to have leftovers. Mm. So um, even when I was cooking for four kids and a husband, I tried to have leftovers. So we didn't mm. have to cook every night and just heat things up. And now it's just myself and my husband, just the two of us. I'm the, I'm the big leftover person because I don't yeah. want to cook every day. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I have just a couple of questions. So, I mean, we've covered dairy, we've covered meat, and they were the main topics I wanted to cover. But I just, you know, when you have some struggly questions at the end, okay. and I just thought, okay, these are just kind of struggly ones that don't have a group. Um, but you meant, I just, just supplementation. This is what I wanted to ask you about. Um, so first of all, you mentioned cod liver oil supplementation. Now, when people think of cod liver oil supplementation, they'll probably think of those little gel tablets mm -hmm. and like, you know, that you find on the shelves. Um, what do you think is the best type of cod liver oil supplement? Okay. So we have looked into cod liver oil a great deal. And okay. most of the commercial cod liver oils are made by a process called the molecular distillation, which is kind of the equivalent of of uh, uh, ultra pasteurization and just totally ruins the oil. And they have to actually add synthetic vitamin A and D back to it because they're destroyed in the process. There are about four brands that we recommend and many of them will ship and are available. So go to our cod liver oil page on our website and you will see- The Western the A Price brand. website. Website, yeah. Western okay. A Price Tower. And you'll see the brands we recommend. now. <clears throat> The most um, economical way to take cod liver oil is a liquid. And I know it's hard for people. I put the liquid in a glass and add some hot water and just stir it down the hatch. Um, but you can also take the capsules. Um, I'll just give you an example. Uh, my daughter-in-law had been put on high dose vitamin D, which we do not recommend. Absolutely. Yeah. Very toxic. Mm. And to get her vitamin D leveled up. And of course it didn't go up. And she was feeling very tired. And I said, you, you gotta stop this vitamin D. And we, she just got on the cod liver oil capsules and her vitamin D went up and she's just taking a few capsules. So um, the cod liver oil is the way to get your A and D. Okay, because many people are deficient in vitamin D. So oh, yeah. rather than taking vitamin D but, supplementation. But then they're taking too much and it's, yeah. it's, it's like taking steroid hormone or something. It's quite toxic. Right, so cod liver um, oil. Another thing mm. that we're seeing more and more of is the desiccated organ meats. Mm. Yes. So yeah. for example, uh, if you've had COVID and your lungs hurt, I would take desiccated lung. Um, there's a company that's selling desiccated oysters, which mm -hmm. I take because I don't like oysters. So, <laughs> and it's a wonderful source of minerals like zinc. I think this is the future of vitamins. Uh, vitamin C, I would not ever recommend taking vitamin C. I would recommend taking a powdered food that's high in vitamin C. So rose hips or amalaki or something like that. Yeah. So that to sense. me, this is yeah. the future of vitamins. It's not the isolated manufactured vitamins. It's taking the food that is high in these nutrients. Yeah, because I'm um, like powdered liver and powdered, you know, that they're, they're very, they're becoming more popular. I'm yeah, noticing. you can get the capsules. Another great food is brewer's yeast mm -hmm. um, for B vitamins, B vitamins. And that's what yeah. they used to give people when they had pellagra and all these vitamin B deficiency diseases. Okay, and what was that called? Sorry, uh, brewer's yeast. Oh, brewer's yeast. Oh, right. Okay, yeah, brewer's yeast. Okay, okay. Um, when it comes to collagen um, supplementation, because obviously that's big on the market, like yeah, people so putting in their sports thing, yeah. drinks, and uh, I don't take them. I don't know much about them. Um, of course, I'm always skeptical. I we just do a lot of soups, a lot of broth. And I think that's the best way. Yeah, because broth is a really good source of yeah. collagen. Yeah, yes. for sure. So um, I think that's pretty much um, all of the questions that I had. And I have to say that was just so, you know, you answered so many questions that I had um, like fully. And I feel like I understand, um, you know, your perspective a bit more. Um, is there anything else that we that we haven't talked about that perhaps you're just like, oh, by the way, the listeners need to know this certain thing? Like, well, um, we have a chapter system all over the world, and I think we need a chapter in the Grand Caymans now. Yes. I'm nominating you. 
to be a chapter leader. So go on the website and look under Get Involved. And okay. tell you how to be a chapter leader. We'd love to have you. We have about 450 chapters all mm -hmm. over the world, and they're a great help to people. If someone wants okay. to get going in this, they would call you and, you know, where where should I shop? You know, where should I, where should I go? Yeah. Um, are we certainly encourage people to be members of the Weston A. Price Foundation because they receive our journal and the journal we kind of have the complicated science-based articles in the front but then a lot of practical advice in the back of the journal yep um I've spent some time on our website it's a huge website it is and you probably find a lot of answers there if you're new to the website we have something called take a tour on mm -hmm. the right hand navigation bar and so I would start there and I, I have to say anybody who's interested in what we've been talking about um if you go onto the Western A Price um website it is huge and you can find pretty much any answer to your question so um yeah. if you want a recipe or if you want to know about a certain food whether it's healthy or not um it pretty much answers everything <laughs> because <laughs> it's been going for a long time I think since yeah. 1999 yeah, you've been running this company <laughs> yeah so and then um, it's not everybody listening to you is from the grand cayman so we also have a website called realmilk.com right it helps you find raw milk uh, throughout the world yep okay fabulous well thank you so much thank um, you for having me Tamara. and i again apologize we've had a hard time connecting but we, we finally did it it was it was totally worth it um thank you so much and i hope we get to chat again fairly soon thank you thank thanks you. for having me